Hello, my name is Blake Dinius. I work for Plymouth County Extension. Percent protection. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So what does fall mean to you, right? For s some people, it's Halloween, maybe uh, Patriots, maybe deer hunting. If, if anyone here goes deer hunting, maybe pumpkin spice, if people here are into pumpkin spice. Um, but for me, I think about ticks. And in the summertime, we're concerned about this tick up here. That's the deer tick, or black-legged tick, is the entomologists like to call it. But you also have these two other ticks in the summer, the dog ticks or wood ticks that we always had growing up, and this lone star tick that hasn't quite made it, um, a, hasn't really established a breeding population here. Some people may have been bit by one, but I have not seen it breed here. It's a, it's a subtropical species of tick that we see on the Cape, we see in Nantucket, we see in Bristol County, but it hasn't been breeding in Plymouth County yet. Um, and that's very common, because where we see, we're, when we first discovered it in Connecticut, for instance, we saw one tick. 10 years went by, and now it's all over Connecticut, especially on islands and areas around the coast. There's this, uh, our friend over here that I'm sure you guys are maybe talking about now, the mosquito, those again kind of tend to go away once we hit October-ish in that area. But in the fall, you still have this tick. It's called the, the deer tick, it still sticks around. This is a year round, 365 day a year tick. It doesn't go away when it starts to get cold. And we actually see this represented in the number of Lyme disease cases that occur, that are reported into the state. And you see the bars represent, in June, July, you can see them spike in the summer, and that's very common. But what you notice here is that it never completely goes away. And these aren't cases that maybe people had Lyme from the summer and didn't see their doctor until January. What we're seeing is that these are cases that occur continually, they're, they're brand new cases. And you usually see a spike during this time period about a month or so, a few weeks after, we get one of those nice warm days, it might be about 60 degrees in January, everyone's going out in shorts and sandals, kind of enjoying that, that, that thaw. And then we see this spike about two to three weeks after of Lyme disease cases. Um, so you can kind of think of it as like, I like to bring it up, the cold doesn't really bother these ticks at all. We actually see black-legged ticks in Lyme disease cases as far up as Alaska, in Ontario and Canada. So when people say that uh, maybe it's too cold, if you ever see something get reported in the papers, will the winter affect ticks? I want you guys all to say no. The, the answer is absolutely 100% no. These ticks actually synthesize glycerol in their blood. That's antifreeze. So they naturally produce an antifreeze. They've been around since, for about 400 million years. They, they've survived the ice age. They live up as far as Alaska. I mean, a winter in New England, yeah, it gets cold. Not cold enough, I'm sorry. Um, and so during the fall season, like I said, you've got those two species of ticks that go away, the dog ticks and the lone star ticks. But where you're left is these. And when we have 10 diseases in Massachusetts that you can get from ticks, Half of them go away, half of them stick around, but the most important one sticks around, which is Lyme disease, that makes up about 80, 90% of all vector-borne diseases in the entire nation. Um, but then you have babesiosis, it's a little bit more rare, that's a little bit like malaria. You've got anaplasmosis, that's another one that attacks your white blood cells. Powassan virus, relatively rare, it's named for Powassan, Ontario. Um, this one is, about, is fatal in about 10% of the cases and there's no treatment. And then you have relapsing fever, which is relatively rare. Um, it's a little, it, you get similar symptoms to Lyme disease, it keeps reoccurring. We still don't know a heck of a lot about it. Um, and so what, what about Lyme disease, right? Lyme is not caused by too many coronas, or I certainly would have gotten it by now, um, especially back in my college days. You know, I don't like coronas, but they're around. It, it, it's just one of those things you deal with when you're in school. Um, it's caused by a spirochete bacteria. It's not a government conspiracy, despite what people are throwing around. They actually trace this DNA of this Lyme spirochete back to the last glacial maximum, back about 20,000 years ago. And it's remained relatively unchanged. And even certain case reports, they looked at the DNA of mice in museum specimens, for instance, back to the 1800s. 
and they found the Lyme spirochete in those mice museum specimens. So, I mean, for people to come up and say like, oh, this is something that was cooked up by the government and accidentally released and spread over the country, I think makes for a great science fiction movie, but it is not, <laughs> it's not the truth whatsoever. Um, but I admit that I, I like, I enjoy that kind of fantasy. I think it's kind of funny. Um, but this, it's a spirochete bacteria, right? It's got a lot of different forms and different shapes that it takes on. When it's inside the tick, it expresses certain proteins, and when it's inside our body, it expresses other ones. It changes, it's constantly adapting, it has a really large genome. And this bacteria um, is highly, in fact, 100% dependent on transmission into other bodies through a tick. And it really needs this deer tick, this black-legged tick. If you were to eliminate black-legged ticks and deer ticks from this area, Lyme disease would go away completely. It just, it needs to have that to continue its cycle. Um, but there's still a lot of questions about Lyme, a lot of really unanswered questions that we're investigating. For instance, is it completely curable? How many strains are there? They've got Lyme disease in Europe, Lyme disease in Asia, and they're caused by different species of this bacteria. We've got Borrelia burgdorferi here, but there's also Borrelia mayoni, Borrelia afzelii, and they're all called Lyme disease despite the fact that they're different species causing it, and they have different symptoms too. It's very interesting. Um, and then the, along with the first aspect is their permanent damage. So even if you can cure it completely, does this leave long lasting effects on a person's body? And we don't really know the answer to those questions yet. And some, and some people, they tend to have these chronic persistent symptoms. We don't know if that's caused by the disease or it's still being present inside that body or by the fact that that disease uh, essentially um, triggered something or turned something on inside someone that, that caused these persistent symptoms to occur. We're investigating that right now. This, the number of cases of tick-borne disease seem to be rising. Um, when you look at when they were being reported in Massachusetts in, the 19, in 1990, they're down here, that's the green bar way down there. And then they slow, they kind of steadily increase up here. You've got some years that are lower, some years that are higher. But overall, everyone can agree that 2016 looks vastly different than 1990 in just a span of about uh, 30 years or so. And then you've got uh, right here the blue bars, that's babesiosis, and then that purple bar, that's anaplasmosis. And you can see them kind of continuing on that same upward trend. We don't know if it's gonna continue that way, um, only time will tell. And there's a lot of factors that kind of go into this, right? So that what, may, what makes someone come down with a case of tick-borne disease, right? They have to get bit by the tick, the tick has to be carrying it, and so infection rates of ticks are really important, how many ticks there are is really important, and the third actually aspect is, does this get diagnosed? Right? So if it doesn't get diagnosed, it doesn't show up as a ping on this thing. And so it's possible that, I, I don't know for sure, it's possible that in 1990, the number of cases of Lyme disease were actually much, much higher. You know, it couldn't even be as high as 2016. And these cases were just flying under the radar. And now all of a sudden doctors are aware and you see this kind of upward trend. But we don't think that's the whole story. We do think that the infection rates of ticks have gone up and that the population of ticks has also gone up. The number of reported cases, and this is like, if you look at this, right, the number of cases, no matter how you slice it, right, they occur in two locations. In the Northeast, right here, and Upper Midwest. That's where the patches of cases, and the vast majority of Lyme disease cases. So Lyme, you know, like I said, right, Lyme, uh, tick-borne diseases make up about 80% of all vector-borne diseases that occur in, in uh, America, right? And most of those, are occurring in right here at home, uh, if you look at Massachusetts, it's almost completely blue. And this is not the way the country voted back in 2016, right? This, each dot is a blue dot of Lyme disease. And you can see this kind of fan out a little bit as you progress from two, 2001 to 2015, but it stays pretty much relatively focused here in Massachusetts. I mean, I've heard different reports. Sometimes people say Maine is the capital of Lyme, you know, New Hampshire is the capital of Lyme, Rhode Island, Connecticut, but I mean, we're all really kind of lumped in there. We're all one big happy family. So what's causing this? And this is really complex, like I said. So when you have different kinds of disease transmission, it's gonna be dependent on, uh, you know, like I said, doctors diagnosing it, how infected the ticks are. But even how infected the ticks are it really depends on 
What kind of animals you have living in the environment? Are these animals that can harbor a disease? Not like, for instance, everyone blames deer, right? Does anyone know that deer are actually immune to Lyme disease? If a tick bites a deer, that deer doesn't get sick. It's got an immune response. They think it's a secondary part of the secondary immune response system. And that tick actually comes off squeaky clean, free of Lyme. So that tick is no longer <laughs> infectious, cannot can't transmit Lyme ever again. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, feed after it bites that deer. So it doesn't matter that these, these ticks are now kind of reformed and no longer infectious and no longer transmitting Lyme. They're never going to eat again after they feed on that deer, and then the deer don't get sick. And so, the, but a mouse, on the other hand, a white-footed mouse, that is almost like a typhoid Mary. That will harbor this pathogen, this Lyme disease pathogen, and pass it on to many, many, many ticks that are biting that mouse. But the mouse doesn't even get sick itself. It just keeps that pathogen, it gets into the skin of the mouse, and any ticks that kind of bite that mouse for months and maybe, I don't even know what the definitive timeline is, but I know it's at least several months um, that that tick, that mouse can now pass on Lyme disease to all of the ticks that bite it. Okay. Yep. Even the, uh you said a particular mouse. Is it any mouse or? White-footed mice are the major thing. Deer mice are a little bit different. Oh, um, rats. rats, I don't know about rats, but I do know that a number of backyard animals are what they call a competent host reservoir or competent reservoir host. And these are ones that are like that mouse, that harbor that pathogen, that pass it on very, relatively easily. And so white-footed mice, chipmunks, shrews, even things like robins and, and grackle and veery, some of these backyard birds, are very good at passing on these pathogens to ticks. But then you have other things like deer are really awful at passing this around. Cat birds are really terrible at passing this around. And then there are a number of animals like possums, for instance, that groom really, they're obsessive groomers. In one study, they groomed off like over 90% of the ticks that were on them at, at night. It was something like 95% or 96% of ticks uh, that were on the opossum, the opossum groomed off. So they're, they're, the, the degree to which these animal communities play a role in this is huge. Oh. Rabbits, rabbits are, are somewhere in the middle. So rabbits get, are able to pass it on for a, few, a couple weeks after they get sick, but they get really, really sick, um, and they don't move around too much after they get sick. So we think that they play a relatively minor role in the transmission of Lyme, but they probably do play some role because they are still infectious. Um, squirrels, not so much. Gray squirrels, not so much. Uh, they're kind of maybe more along the same lines of uh, like a cat bird or where they're not too infectious. Um, what's interesting is that we notice that the incidence, this is the rate at which Lyme disease occurs, it's a percentage, is the highest in suburban communities. So an area like Lakeville, prime area for, for Lyme disease. An area like Brockton, not so much, but if you go to like Western Mass and some of those places, not, maybe not Amherst, but some areas maybe in the Berkshire County and some where you get these almost like farmland kind of areas, also really low. And even like deep woods, Maine, where it's like all complete woods, completely wild, that area also really low. Maine has one of the highest incidence rates in the country. Uh, it's usually one or two, and it's almost exclusively tied to that Bar Harbor area that stretch along the coast. So when you see these suburban communities that are around the coast, I mean, Nantucket, uh, Martha's Vineyard, perfect. The Cape, perfect. The, the Fairhaven. New Bedford, like there, maybe you know those areas are also really high. Marion, Mattapoisett, really high. Wareham, these suburban communities along the coast, um, Cohasset, uh, also really, really high. And a lot of researchers asked why. You would think that it would continue along the certain like gradient, right? That you would either be higher where there's a lot of animals, and as you started to get rid of animals, you might get lower and lower, fewer and fewer ticks, and then you got to urban setting where you have almost no ticks. But instead, we see this spike in the middle, and then it goes back down. It's really interesting. And we think it has to do with this concept that they call forest fragmentation. That as you start to chop up a forest, not all animal communities disappear at the same rate, in the same way, then maybe some of these animals leave these communities a little bit sooner than others. And so certain things like uh, deer, they tend to stick around, right? And then like I said, the chipmunks and, and mice, 
they tend to stick around. What you tend to see go away mostly are foxes and bobcats, um, black bears, and we don't even have wolves now. We used to have wolves, I guess, and wolves were really good at controlling these. So some of these predators that really like to eat these animals, they tend to kind of go away and disappear. And what you, what you have is this, a higher population of these that are in close contact with humans, and so you have a tick buffet, basically. And so that's, that's the idea. And then as you go to a more urban setting, now these start to go away. But when you start developing land, putting in like Whole Foods and Walmarts and things like that, then the predators are, are kind of one of the first things to go. Um, so ticks feed on 125 different animals. And like I said, the composition of these communities is really going to make a huge difference on whether or not the populations are big or whether or not they're infectious. I want to talk a little bit about the infection cycle. I'm going to just go over this real quick because it's pretty complex. So ticks are born in, around the spring from eggs. The adult female deer tick will blast out about 2,000 eggs every single year. Well, she'll die afterward, but each one will blast out about 2,000. So when people say, does anything eat ticks? The answer is yes, a lot of things eat ticks. Chickens eat ticks. We even have a wasp that specializes in finding ticks and killing them. But 2,000 is a big number for every single tick, and we just don't have quite good control over that when it comes to natural predators and natural parasites. Um, they're born as larvae, and they're never born with Lyme disease. So they have to acquire it some way. And the other thing about ticks is they only ever eat three times in their whole life. So they, they live for two years, and they only ever eat three times. And so they have to pick up this infection and in one of those three times. And it can't be the last one, because then they're never going to feed again, right? So it's got to be the first one or the second one. And when they're larvae, they're, they're, they're disease-free, essentially. And the, and the larvae, they might be around right now. But they're going to be feeding on these animals, like I said, the mice, the chipmunks, the robins. And some of those animals are carrying this disease, right? If they bite a clean animal, they're clean. If they bite an infected animal, they become infected. But then they don't feed again until this second stage, this nymph stage tick. And this is why we see that huge spike in the summertime, because that coincides with the emergence of these nymphs that, have, that fed last summer and then are going to come out really late April, early May, and they're gonna last until about the end of June. And so these nymph stage ticks are tiny, they're about 25% of the time infected with Lyme disease, they're hard to see, and, uh, but these nymphs, they feed on people too. And, they, and that they can also feed on, these again, on some of these other animals, some of these infected mice and these infected chipmunks, and then they become adults, which are also infective as well. Infectious and the adults are really looking to feed on large mammals, so usually deer, but also people. And what we see is since now they've had two chances to feed, they're about double what the nymphs were. So the nymphs are around 25% in our area. Adults, which are active right now, are about 50% in infectious. So the issue with the, the adults is while they do have a greater chance of passing on Lyme disease, they're a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to see. And so we think that. The reason why we don't see another big spike in the fall is because people are actually finding these ticks before they're able to pass on Lyme disease. Um, so one of the things is that people always want to target deer. Whenever you ask the question, why are ticks so bad, everyone points their finger at deer. And deer are a really important reproductive host. Without deer, the tick population crashes. And I'm talking without deer. I'm not talking about reducing the deer population. They've tried to reduce deer. Um, it's worked on islands and peninsula where you reach this really, really low threshold of deer. But if you get about a 50% reduction, you get the same number of ticks. On one, on one, for instance, on one island, we, ha we tried this experiment, but Mohegan Island. They killed every single deer except for two deer. There were two deer left on that island. And what they found is there were just more ticks on these two deer. They tick, the deer were loaded with ticks, but there were the same number of ticks. The deers had this, the ticks had the same infection rates. It just, until they got rid of those last two deer, then they saw that population crash. And they've seen this repeated again, like I said, on other islands and also peninsula, where you can really, they have small, po small communities, small populations, they can really get rid of all the deer. This might be a really good experiment 
maybe to run in hull, for instance, where you can kind of close off hull, get rid of all the deer, and you might be able to get rid of all the, the black-legged ticks on hull. An area like Lake Phil, I can't imagine you putting up, I don't know, border walls or something and trying to get our, rid of, prevent immigration, get rid of all those deer in there, I don't know. Um, but in any case, this is not really a feasible strategy. Um, it's just not great. Um, it's not financially feasible. Um, like I said, in this particular study, they, what they determined is there might be this minimum threshold of about 12 deer per square mile. Um, in some areas of the country, you might be looking at like 60 to 80, maybe even uh, higher than that, deer per square mile. So you're talking huge reductions in the number of deer. They tried this experiment um, in, in Connecticut and it was actually, it wasn't the animal rights activists that were up in arms about um, the, the deer being culled. It was actually the hunters. The hunters were complaining and they said there weren't enough deer to hunt and they still, the researchers still did not yet reach that threshold. It, it was past the point that hunters could find deer. That's how low we're looking at these deer populations. Um, so overall, not great bang for your buck, but I'm, <laughs> Um, we've got this new thing coming out. It's like, we used to have vaccines, right? A lot of people ask que questions about vaccines. Um, we used to have one, it was called Limerix. It was taken off the market. There's a lot of controversy surrounding it. In my personal opinion, if they put that back on the market, I would take that tomorrow. I really don't believe that it was taken off the market for any good reason. Um, but they're coming out with a new one. Uh, it's, it might, it might, they might get enough money for it to release it, they might not, we're not really sure. Um, this one's coming out over in Europe. And um, the, the biggest question is, it's gonna cost millions, maybe multiple millions of dollars to put this on the market. And can a company recoup that money uh, based on profit? And that's the biggest question. When you look at the number of cases that are reported each year in the United States, what is actually reported by the CDC ends up being around 30,000 cases, right? If, you're, if a company is sinking millions, maybe billions of dollars into this vaccine, how long is it gonna take to recoup that? And we've got a lot of vaccine fears, and if this isn't required, is, is, is a company really gonna be able to generate the money to, to earn that back? And so that's the biggest question we have regarding vaccines. But we do have vaccines for dogs, um, so I do recommend that you vaccinate your, your dogs. Um, once again, like I said, so the CDC um, officially reports about 30,000 cases. They have admitted that it's about 10, that, that an actual number of cases is 10 times that number. But they still don't report that. They just say, we're reporting 30,000, it's probably 10 times higher. Um, but if you ask researchers and you ask scientists that have been studying this for a really long time, they'll tell you that this 300,000 number likely is still a low ball estimate when it comes to the number of cases of Lyme disease. And what's interesting is that I think that if you could develop a method of accurately diagnosing Lyme to the point where you would actually know if it's 300,000 or maybe a million cases, now all of a sudden you have a company that says, well now we can make money off this vaccine. Now we can make money off this research and we can, it's almost like it feeds into itself. And so I think the, the most critical aspect of this is that we need a better diagnostic technique. And I think that, and that's actually coming down the line. It seems like that that is in the works and we may see that in the relative near future. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, other diseases too. So even if we did have a Lyme vaccine, what about these four other diseases that you can get in the fall, right? And we, the ticks we see in Massachusetts are about 10% infected with either babesiosis or anaplasmosis. So they're still really bad, plus and virus again. And then in the summertime, you've got these five other diseases transmitted by two other ticks. Uh, again, really bad. So a vaccine, while well, good, it's not gonna be this catch-all. It's not gonna be the thing that is gonna protect you from every single tick out there. I wanna talk a little bit about this alpha-gal allergy. So this is not a feminist superhero despite the name alpha-gal. This is actually the allergy to red meat or what I like to call is the mammalian meat allergy because it's gonna hit other things, not just red meat. Sometimes you'll hear it called just the red meat allergy. You think it's just steak. Oh no, I can't have steak. But I wanna tell you that it also means you can't eat bacon, you can't eat ice cream, you can't eat cheese, you can't eat your milk and cereal, and you can't eat gummy bears. Because these are mammalian products that either contain gelatin or dairy, and it, this alpha-gal allergy, it sometimes impacts those as well. So yeah, maybe no burgers and steaks. Uh, my fiance, she's, she doesn't really like red meat. 
But then, so she's like, oh yeah, I'd be fine. But what about taking away bacon? I mean, come on. Even kids that don't like eating any other food, you can still get them to eat bacon. Bacon and mac and cheese, and they, they always, they'll always eat those things. Um, and so yeah, no one really wants to end up kind of like that. Um, so what are we gonna do, right? So what we have here is this, maybe the dynamics are changing, right? Back in the, back in the old days, when uh, you maybe only had the dog tick or the, the wood tick, right? And now we have all these other diseases to worry about. There's all this stuff going on, and the, the parameters have changed. The environment we're living in has changed, but we're still living our lives the same way. We still kind of go and do the same thing. And so we, that, I think, is one important aspect of why we see that kind of increase in tick-borne diseases, is that things have gotten, uh, the ticks have gotten worse, but we're still behaving the same way. If we adapt to that situation, we can actually reduce the number of tick-borne diseases um, that occur. Um, so like I said, this is me. I love fly fishing. I'm fly fishing out at the Deerfield River. And this whole area is perfect prime tick habitat. What did I say? Near water, right? You've got tall grass. Everyone says ticks are there. I've got deep woods. I've got leaves. All these nice places where deer, uh, deer ticks like to be. And I went home that day. I didn't have a single tick on my body. I can tell you this. Whenever I've gone camping, I never have ticks on my body. I go out purposely looking for ticks as another aspect of my job, never have ticks on my body. This is just kind of the way I, I can live my life free and just go out there and enjoy myself. I think about ticks before I go out and I think about ticks when I do a tick check after I go out. When I'm doing my activity, I don't think about ticks at all. I go wherever I want, I do whatever I want to do and I don't worry about ticks. What do you put on so that you don't have to worry about it? <laughs> We're going to get into that. Um, so one of the things is uh, you can keep a tidy lawn. So manicuring your lawn, this is a well-groomed American lawn, and that is what, the reason that's really important is because, because ticks heavily rely on moisture to survive. If I were to bring a deer tick, even though the deer ticks are active this time of year in the fall, if I bring a deer tick into this room and I leave it here for a couple days, that tick will die. It, there's no way for it to survive in an atmosphere like this room. It needs to have dense shrubs, uh, leaves, things like that. And we've actually learned that ticks will require these leaves and snow cover in order to survive the winter. So while they do produce that antifreeze, they still need a small degree of insulation uh, to protect them through the winter. So raking leaves now, for instance, can will reduce the number of ticks that you may see the next spring, um, maybe enhance their mortality and kind of get rid of that almost blanket that they would use to survive the winter. So ticks are really small. Like I said, ticks do have an interesting way of drinking water. They actually absorb it through crystals from the atmosphere. They, they, they take their mouth and they, they kind of put a little bit of crystals out on their, on their mouth parts. It absorbs in water and then they lap it back up. And, this is the and so if you don't have a, a certain humidity in the atmosphere, the ticks aren't gonna be able to absorb that water. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so like I said, these are kind of the tick homes you wanna think about. This is Japanese Barbary. You've got, it's a dense shrub, but you're also gonna find ticks on things like Pachysandra, for instance. You've got long, sweeping uh, amounts of Pachysandra. You may find ticks there. Leaves, wood piles, rock walls, um, the edges of lawns, maybe not necessarily the center of lawns. Um, like I said, they use the leaves and snow to survive the winter. One of the things you can do in your yard as well, and I know this is kind of hotly debated, like I said, I'm trying to give you guys tools. You don't all have to do these. But if you do a yard, you can do a yard spray. And if you do it, I would recommend doing it with a synthetic, not an all natural product. Or either you wanna use the synthetic or don't do one at all. That's basically what I would recommend. The all naturals just really are not that great. Um, what we see is about 88% of ticks are about less than 10 feet from the forest edge. So this is why these, these perimeter yard sprays work really well against ticks. You've got mosquitoes, people spray for mosquitoes, but the mosquito sprays are relatively temporary. They impact adult mosquitoes that are flying around, but mosquitoes breed, like they can breed in the woods and they can repopulate your, your home. With these yard sprays, what we see is that if you, do these, if you do this twice a year with a synthetic, you do it in the right spots, you do it at the right time and you, and you repeat this every year, you get about a close to 100% reduction of the number of ticks in your yard. They just don't make it through that barrier because ticks have to crawl up and over these, these areas. They don't make it cross that. Do people um, come out and spray for you? 
Yeah, you would have to pay someone to spray this. It should cost about $100 or $130 an application. And like I said, twice a year, you're looking at $200, $250 a year. If they're charging you more, then they're taking you for a ride. So they're, they're, they're overcharging you for that. What you want to spray is early May and early June. This coincides with that nymph, remember I was talking about the nymph stage ticks come out really at the end of April. This synthetic, the reason you want synthetics is because it has residual activity. It lasts for about four weeks. And so you spray once in May, you get the four weeks of protection. You spray once in June, you get the four weeks of protection there. That's the entire nymph season and you kind of knock out that whole generation there. And that's why it works really, really well. If you use your all naturals, the all natural products are shown to work in laboratory studies with direct application. So if you were to spray a tick directly, it can, cause, it can kill the tick, but then after that stuff dries, it no longer can kill that tick. So it's good for while it's volatile. So if you've ever had an all natural spray, you walk in your yard, it smells like uh, maybe spaghetti sauce. Um, it's only gonna kill ticks during that time. Once that's dry, it only has a small amount of repellency and that is it. You get a heavy rain, it's gone. And so, but this, this lasts through rain, lasts for about four weeks, and that's why that this works. I was, otherwise, I would say, don't really use the all-natural at all, because you're not really getting anything out of it. Um, you've got these tick tubes. Um, these are just simply not reliable. So they can work. They worked in one study. Um, Tom Mather, Dr. Tom Mather, he, he's, he works at uh, URI. He ran this study in 1987, where it showed some reduction in the number of ticks, right? But then Tom Daniels ran it for two years. Kirby Stafford ran two different studies over two years. They ran it through multiple states and multiple locations. They never saw in any of the locations a single amount of reduction in the number of ticks. So you've got it worked once, and I don't know, is this a case where you flip a coin three times and you get heads three times in a row? Uh, that's what I think is going on there. Or you might have, in Tom's case, um, this perfect composition of animal communities where you have exclusively white-footed mice, no chipmunks, no robins, no rabbits, no veery or any. I don't know what went on in his study. I'm not sure why it worked once, but what we need in the scientific community is reproducibility, and we did not get that here. And they, it's been tried a number of times. So so if you want to keep doing this, I mean, I like wearing you know, my Red Sox hat when the Red Sox play. Um, I feel like it makes them win more. Uh, kind of think of it like that. Um, what about going outside? So like I said, you were asked the question, what do I do when I go outside? Um, I spend more time outside my yard than in my yard. I actually don't get a yard spray even though um, it is an option because I'm not really in my yard a heck of a lot. I'm spending more time outside. Um, you can do this thing tucking your pants into your socks. Um, it's really nerdy, but I've been a nerd my entire life, so I have no problem with people looking at me funny. Um, but the reason I do this is because you have this nice gap between your ankle and your pant cuff, right? And sometimes ticks get all the way up underneath there and they keep crawling all the way up to places that only your doctor should have access to. And uh, I once met this guy, for instance, and he told me, he said, the tick made me pee in two different streams. And I said, I do not want to ever end up like that. That is not a position, especially when I'm out camping and that happened, I'm like, oh boy, I don't know how, <laughs> how is this, how, you know, I, I just, that's not a situation I want to be in. So this is why I do, I tuck my pants into my socks. I do this when I'm walking through deep woods, when I know I'm going into habitat where I'm going to encounter a lot of ticks, or I know I'm going out and I may not have the chance to do a tick check, um, maybe not have the chance to go and do a shower, uh, take a shower, do a very thorough tick check. Um, but covering up only gets you so far, and this is one of my biggest uh, qualms with some of these suggestions that you might see in the newspaper. They always say, for mosquitoes, so they just cover up. And like people are just like, is that all you're really gonna tell me just to cover up? There's gotta be more, right? And there is. So there's this product that's called permethrin, and you can apply this to your clothing and it will repel ticks and it also kills them. So any ticks that touch your clothing are destined to die. So you walk through the woods and it's like, ping, 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 ping. It doesn't actually make that noise, but you can, I imagine that when I'm walking through the woods, <laughs> that ticks are just kind of touching me and dying. And I've done this, I've repeated this uh, for certain people. Um, when, I, when I'm out doing hikes or walks, I, I'll, someone will have a tick on them and I'll say, give me that, I'll stick it on my pants, and then that tick will fall off and die. One of my friends, before I got this job, he got Lyme disease, and I said, dude, you're gonna get me out of a job. If I can't even convince my friend 
to, to use this stuff. I'm not going to be able to hold down this job. So I drove over to his house. I had a pair of shoes that I had treated. It was actually these shoes right now that I treated with this permethrin. I took a tick and I put it on there and it died. And my friend said, wow, that actually worked. And I said, yeah, science proves it works. It actually flipping works. And so this stuff is really, really effective. It and, kills a lot of things. <laughs> and one, uh, but the reason, yeah, the reason you want to do this is that it's about where you're spraying it, right? So if you're spraying, people worry about if you're spraying it willy-nilly in your yard, that would be your permanent per yard spray, right? But if spraying it on your clothes, I'm not too worried. It's not going to move from your clothes onto things that you're walking around in. Oh. But in any case, it works really well against ticks. Very, very effective. In one study they showed it was like 99.96 protection from ticks in the summertime. Yep. Would that affect, what if you were walking your dog? Does that affect the dog at all? No, it's actually, so this bottle is about half a percent permethrin. The, the tick and flea stuff that you put on your dog is around 50%. So it's about, it's very, it's much, much more concentrated that you would put directly on a dog than you would spray on the outside of your clothes. Um, so how do you use it? Clothing and shoes only, I actually recommend spraying it on any fabrics that you would set on the ground. So I have a backpack that I go backpacking with, always setting my backpack on the ground, take out a drink of water, you know, sit, sit on a rock, kind of that kind of thing. So things that you put on the ground, if you think ticks, they're gonna be from your waist down. Right? So in the summertime, they're really about ankle height and down. I usually say from Memorial Day to Labor Day, think ankle height. And from Labor Day to Memorial Day, think waist height. And that, that's kind of the frame of mind that you want to think about where ticks are going to be. So anything that is below that area, that's where the ticks are going to be. They, don't, they never climb trees. You know, they don't kamikaze jump out of these trees and try to land on you. Um, they don't fly and they don't jump. And so the, the, the ticks, are, they will quest. They, can get, they might get as high as this chair, for instance. They'll quest up onto like a branch or a stick or green briar, but they won't get much higher than that. Um, so you wait for this stuff to dry after you apply it, and it lasts through six washings or one month. So if you just treat, like I don't keep track of the washings necessarily because I know I'm not going to wash something more than six times in one month. I just spray whatever clothes I go hiking in Every month, I just spray it the first week of every month. It's really about 42 days or so that it lasts. So if, you, if it doesn't end at like 31, and it lasts a little bit, and in practice, it tends to even last a little bit longer than that. Things, it's really the sun and things will break it down. But I spoke with a woman who, she had a pair of shoes that she sprayed in October, and then in February it still worked because she didn't really wear, she didn't really use the shoes that often. They could, she used them once a week, they sat in her attic and then she would put them on and then, and so they were really good for a very, very long period of time. Is this safe for humans, right? Safe for infants, toddlers, and children, safe for pregnant and nursing mothers. You really don't get safer than that. And this is a proof safe for all these things. They can use it quite perfectly fine. Um, the one thing you want to be careful about is cats. Um, I love my cat even more than my fiance. Um, and so anything that you want to, uh, I, you know, I would really want to protect my cat more than anything in the world. Um, and when I heard about this stuff, it says that the cats are sensitive to it. And this is because permethrin, it mimics a plant toxin. It's not, it, it doesn't come from plants, it's not natural, it's synthetic but it mimics something found in plants, and cats have really lost their ability to break down a lot of these plant toxins. And so if you ever had a cat get into like lilies, for instance, or begonias, they start vomiting. And so it, it, it really severely impacts cats. But if you wait for it to dry, you're okay. And so these pants have been sprayed with that. I let my cat sit on my lap all the time. She looks her fur on my lap. It's okay. Once it's once it's dry, it binds really, really tightly to whatever fabric you have. It's only really going to impact the ticks around you. It's not going to impact, it's not going to spread onto leaves and things like that. Um, what about skin? So that, that's, that's the perfect thing you can do is permethrin on clothing, but what happens if you want to wear sandals or shorts, you want to go out walking, um, show off some of your um, nice cleanly shaven, shaved legs. Um, you can wear these EPA registered repellents, and I would really only recommend EPA registered. And the reason behind that is because when something becomes EPA registered, it actually has to be proven to be safe and effective. They have to actually have to have data and studies are required to prove that this stuff works and that it's safe to use. So when you pick up a bottle and it says repels ticks and mosquitoes, they're not allowed to say that 
unless there's a study that proves that, and there should have be an EPA registration number on the back of that. Hmm. Um, these repellents, things like DEET, um, they work on the tick's howler's organ. So this is the way the tick smells the environment. So if you look at this tick, she's got her hands up like that. Um, that's because she's actually sensing where we are. This tick actually is blind. It, it, it cannot see where we are. So it's relying solely on us to come to it and to be able to, to smell us coming to it. So it's gonna smell, it can actually smell things like body heat, um, but uh, sweat, body odors, all of these things are gonna cue that tick to then come up and say, oh, I'm really excited. I know that there's food around and I'm gonna swing around my arms. I don't know where you are, but I'm gonna swing around my arms and then if you brush against me, now I'm gonna hook my claw into whatever fabric you're wearing or skin or hair or anything and then hitch a ride on you and now I know I'm on you. And so this is how the tick kind of feels around its environment and makes its way to its host. Um, so the, the, the big one is DEET, that's been the most common one, that's been available for people to buy for about 60 years. Back in 2001 they estimated about a billion applications were applied, they, there's about 200 million people that use it worldwide. We've, had, we've seen about four deaths from this related to DEET, and so a lot of times people talk about DEET toxicity, when you think about it, 8 billion people have you, you used this. 200 million people use it annually, and maybe four, four people maybe died, and they, don't, they didn't even trace it back to DEET, they just said, it's possible it's DEET. And so when you think about a safety profile for this kind of thing, very, very squeaky clean safe. I mean, about 150 people die per year from falling coconuts. So, I'm not, or even like gum, I've seen more people die from chewing gum than DEET. And so when you think about what is safe, DEET is relatively safe, it's, it's about as safe as you get. Um, but you also have picaridin and IR3535, which is Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard. So any of these three will work. Um, for these three products, you want about 20% uh, or more. Anything more than 20%, you don't repel more ticks. So if 100% DEET does not repel more ticks than 20% DEET. It might last a little bit longer, but if people are really concerned with overexposure, um, maybe minimizing their exposure to different chemicals, you just need 20%. You've got two other things, and these are also EPA registered. The CDC recommends them. But right now, they don't, there isn't any data on these to support that they repel black-legged ticks or deer ticks in the wild. There have been some like, lab studies where they put them in a little Petri dish uh, on filter paper and it repels the deer ticks, but they, they, they haven't shown that they repel deer ticks when applied to skin and fabrics and get exposed to the elements. So they probably work really well. Um, but again, the other three products, they're actually scientific studies of people wearing these things and walking outside and it repelling ticks. I wanna talk a little bit about these all naturals, which I've been talking uh, a lot about recently and kind of tending to stay away. I would rather you use some of these other EPA registered stuff, but if you, I know people have come up to me and say, I, I'm gonna, fine, I'm gonna use nothing. I had this one woman come up to me, she had a cigarette in her hand, she had a glass of wine, and she said, I don't do chemical anything. And I was like, oh geez, <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but if you're gonna use all naturals, you know, just, you can, I'd rather you use something than nothing. They do work, but what they find is that they, they range anywhere from zero, they don't work at all, to about 30%, where some of them have some repellency. Um, in this particular study, um, they had water here, and so this is, was a yard spray, but you had water on the right, on the left here, and the higher bar means they found more ticks in this area, so they found a lot of ticks with water. And then this bar here, that's an all natural, that's an all natural, and so they're really no different from water when these, in these sprays. Um, this one, Accenture IC3, this is a very common spray that is used for some of those all natural yard sprays. And then on the right here, you have bifenthrin, that's a synthetic spray, you, they found no ticks. And they repeated this uh, four different times. Again, your all natural products, really no different from water, bifenthrin, synthetic, much, much more effective. Uh, protection for pets, um, everyone knows pets like doing this, and what did I say, ticks love being in there, and then pets like doing this, right? And so the, the pets themselves can get sick, they can get all kinds of different diseases, um, even ones that aren't really that common in humans. For instance, cats can get this thing called cytoxenosis, which you don't really get in people. Um, 
But another reason you want to protect pets is because this is another avenue of exposure. So they can be a little bit like Trojan horses where the tick might not bite that pet right away, and then the, the pet will lay on our lap, and then the tick might crawl off and bite us. So in the winter time, you might let Sparky out, out the front door, Sparky comes back in with a couple ticks, sits on your lap, you're in your pajamas, they're not treated with permethrin, you're not ready, you know, you're not thinking about ticks, they're not on your mind, and you just brought a tick in, and you have no idea where it ended up. Um, a lot of times people will tell me, they say, I was bit by a tick, oh no, I had Lyme disease, and I was never even bit by a tick, I never even saw a tick. I suspect that that happens a lot of times when uh, people don't even realize, they weren't even outside, but something may have brought that tick in. And while that tick, might not live very long, might not live more than a couple days, if it gets a foothold on you, if it starts biting, now it's getting all the water it needs from your blood. Um, so uh, for, for pets, there's a bunch of different products on the market. I've talked with veterinarians on this. They always give me a different response every single time. And they say, send them to me. My name is blah, 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 send them to my, and I'm like, I wish, I just want a more straightforward answer, but I, I've looked up things, I've looked up a bunch of research, they essentially all work, but they, because they're a medication and they might be specific to your dog or your cat, um, your veterinarian would know that best. Um, but if they do tell you to use something, don't try to cheap out and try to compare products and get the cheaper one or get a different one. Um, so these two things, even though the boxes look similar, um, you know, this one's made for dogs and this one's made for cats. I know this kind of looks like a cat, but you still cannot apply this to a cat. Then you can actually severely harm that cat, maybe even kill that cat. Um, and so uh, it's really important that you follow the directions of, of what your veterinarian says. Um, and again, you can vaccinate your dogs against Lyme. Um, it's, it's a really interesting thing. Um, but no, so no protection is 100%. Um, so you have to still do tick checks. I, I do basically spray my clothes with permethrin every month. I put on repellents on my skin. I still do a tick check. I don't, I almost never find, uh, I never find ticks. If um, your vision isn't as good as it used to be, Especially for, uh, for me, if I'm out, like I said, if I'm out camping, I don't necessarily want to have my buddy come up, hey, hey, Leo, you want to check, check my neck out for me? It's just, I use my fingertips. I, I kind of, and I, it's weird, I actually know how the back of my neck feels. I got really, really used to it, and I know exactly how it feels. So if I feel a new bump or anything new, I mean, anytime you feel a new bump or you see something that looks interesting on your skin, another good reason to get a second opinion. It might not be a tick but it's still a good idea to get that checked out. Um, so uh, basically the concept of, I wanna jump into this, is how do ticks really make us sick? Um, so ticks actually feed on us through what we call a feeding lesion. They don't actually, they actually damage our skin tissue. And so, uh, the, but the Lyme disease bacteria is actually in the gut of the tick, and the bacteria, it's a one-way street. So the bacteria can't actually go out through that mouth part it actually takes blood to kind of activate this bacteria, and then the bacteria makes its way into the salivary glands, and then those salivary glands, basically, when the tick goes, and this is gonna be really disgusting, when it, it's gonna, it spits into your body, right? And so when that tick spits into your body, that's when you get that bacteria. And so we know that this whole procedure takes hours. And this is where that whole concept of that 24 hour rule comes into play. Um, it's not hard and fast. It's not a 24 hour rule is not hard and fast. It's just, when does that bacteria get activated? When does it make it into the salivary glands? And when does that tick decide to spit that bacteria into your body? Um, so, don't, uh, the other thing is don't rely on feeling a tick. 90% um, of the people did not find, in this study, did not find and remove the nymph t stage tick in less than the 24 hours. So, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the thing that I kind of want to bring a, make, uh, make a point on. 13% of the people did not find and remove this nymph by two and a half days. And so when people tell me that they've never even noticed a tick, I mean, 90% of the people didn't, didn't notice that tick in, in the time frame that it would take to transmit Lyme most of the time, right? And then still, after two and a half days, now this tick is probably about the size of a Tic Tac at this point, there, over 10% of the people still did not find and remove this tick. What do you do if you find a tick after a tick check? Um, you don't wanna panic, right? <laughs> I know easier said than done. Uh, 
I was, I've ever, only ever been bit by one tick in my whole life. I was bit by a, an American dog tick when I was a kid, and I did not follow this, this, uh, this advice right here. I ran screaming to my dad. My dad, the savior, clearly came. Uh, he was like, just like, you know, pulled the tick off for me with his handy tweezers, and um, what he did is he actually put it on his workbench, came over with a hammer, and uh, I still think that that is the most masculine way to kill a tick. <clears throat> Up. So what do you do if you find the tick right? You don't want to overcomplicate things. On the internet, you always have these things like life hacks or quick ways to do this, 10 top ways to do this, talking about like microwaving something that you could just eat, eat normally or I don't know, they do really weird stuff. Um, just grab a pair of tweezers, remove the tick properly. You want to grab, um, you want to grab this black part here. This is called the scutum. It's really hard. You want to grab really close to the skin. If you try to, try to grab the back end, that gets really soft as the tick starts to feed. But this part here is still really, really hard. And you just want to pull straight up with slow and steady pressure. No petroleum jelly, no matches, no gasoline, none of these other, not, not taking dish soap and putting it on a cotton ball and like trying to smother the tick and get it to back out. Um, those either don't work, or either it takes too long to remove the tick, or they actually cause that tick to regurgitate. And what did I say? That that bacteria goes into your body when that tick spits, right? So what, we don't know what that does. We, we, they're leaning towards that regurgitation maybe not causing Lyme disease, but we still don't know for sure. And so I wouldn't hate to enhance your risk by saying to do any one of those things. The tweezers, it's simple. It doesn't cause that tick to regurgitate. You just get that tick off. Um, sometimes what people is referred to the hypostome, sometimes people call this the beak or the mouth or the head of the tick. Um, sometimes that can break off. But that, the Lyme bacteria is actually in this body of the tick. You get that body off, your risk of disease transmission stops. And so it's actually okay to leave that, that head inside underneath your skin. It's a little bit like a splinter at that point. You just want to apply a little bit of antiseptic, neosporin or bacitracin, and that would, to prevent secondary infection. And then your body will kind of work that head. It'll, it'll do its job and kind of work that out. Um, if you look at that, it's covered in these barbs. It actually has, secretes a cement that coats those barbs. And it's going to be really, it sometimes it's really hard to break that, um, to pull that mouth part out. And like I said, sometimes that just breaks off. Sometimes the easiest thing is just that thing breaks off. After you remove the tick, uh, most people will flush it down the toilet. My dad, I said, he liked to hit it with a hammer. He, he thought for some reason in his head that ticks could swim back up from inside a toilet. And they can't do that. Um, but it's still really cool. As a kid, I was like, whoa. It was like very, very cool. Um, I want to actually have you save the tick. If you're ever bit by a tick, I want you to actually save it. Put it in a bag and write the date on that bag. And the reason behind this is because things like Lyme disease, like I said, the diagnosis is really contentious, really weird things. And what we know about the way that some of these tick-borne diseases are diagnosed has to do with the circumstance surrounding your symptoms. If you walked into your doctor, some of these symptoms are like headache, nausea, um, feeling lethargic. And I'm telling you, I feel like that every Monday morning, right? And so they're kind of really ambiguous symptoms. And so the symptoms are usually, the diagnosis is usually in conjunction to a scenario. You were bit by a tick. And so if you have this date on the bag, you can bring it to your doctor. He can look at it or she can look at it. Black-legged tick, you were bit about two to three weeks ago. Okay, the odds are that your symptoms are probably, core, probably associated with this tick bite. If you were... The date's important because if you're trying to remember, oh, maybe it was Labor Day, I don't know, that, you basically told the doctor nothing. You said, I was bit by a tick once upon a time. Um, and, so, and so these aspects are really important for gathering evidence. You can email a picture and get that tick identified. So that it, sometimes people have something on their body. Sometimes it's a spider. Sometimes it's a beetle. They don't know. They think it's a tick. This website, Tick Encounter, they'll identify that tick or that insect or whatever. They'll do it for free. They do it really quickly. Um, I can do it too, but you know, I, I, I'm not as, they're like a full team doing this. And so they, have, they can do it a lot more quickly than I can. Um, you can get the tick tested. And so this doesn't, a positive test on a tick test, they're going to actually look at that tick, uh, grind it up, extract the DNA or RNA if they're looking for viruses, and determine what germs are in that tick. Um, 
that doesn't mean that you have the disease. If you were bit by a tick that's carrying Lyme disease, does not mean, necessarily mean you have Lyme disease. But what this can tell you is a few different things. First, if there's co-infection. That means if this tick is carrying more than one thing. So in this particular tick, this bit, this 79 year old woman, it was carrying Lyme disease and babesiosis. She said it was only attached for 12 hours, but looking at that tick, I know it was attached for much, much longer. What's really important about this is that these two diseases, if this woman has it, are treated with different medication. And not all doctors realize that babesiosis is present in their particular area. And at her age, babesiosis can be fatal. And so if she walked into her doctor's office without this tick report, feeling kind of bad, um, said she was bit by a tick, said it was only on her for 12 hours, that doctor may, one, send her out because it wasn't on her for, he, he, she told her it was, him it wasn't on her for 24 hours, or only treat for Lyme. There's a number of different factors where this woman may not get treated for babesiosis and could end up in the hospital after that. But the tick report, now you can show this to the doctor, the doctor can look at both the tick and what's in the tick and say, well, maybe we wanna look at more things. Maybe there's more going on here Maybe we should track your progress. If you're not feeling symptoms now, maybe f call me immediately as soon as you start feeling something or so on. Uh, I'm not a doctor, so, but I don't know what they would do. But again, this is good evidence that you can bring to a doctor to help them out in solving the problem. You, and if you ever get uh, a rash, I want you to actually take a picture. So this is not to sh post on Facebook or social media. This is because uh, this is the bullseye rash, right, that we know is associated with Lyme. This is also the bullseye rash down here, looks nothing like a bullseye. And so uh, again, taking that picture, bringing it to a doctor, letting them give their own medically qualified opinion on what's going on can be really, really helpful. Um, take any, if these start to change, take another picture. So this is called the erythema migrans, they call it bullseye rash. It actually spans uh, out to be eight inches in diameter or so. So it gets really, really big. So again, a really if you take a picture when it's small and then another one it's big, and then they get, and then you should go up to the doctor and now it's even bigger, they'll be like, okay, classic bullseye rash. Um, or you know, if anything changes, it's really important um, that you capture that evidence. Everyone has cameras on their phone nowadays, so it shouldn't be very hard. Um, and so that's pretty much covers it all. So the bottom line is that ticks can be pretty scary but with the right knowledge and awareness, all tick-borne diseases are preventable. And at this point, I will take any questions.